Okay, you want to open your Bibles to Ephesians 4. And what we're going to actually cover is what we looked at tonight a little bit in expository preaching. As we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. As we look at the growth of the church, God's way. Now, you know that church growth is a huge issue in our day. A lot of churches are really into church growth, but growth to them means usually activities or it means numbers. It doesn't necessarily mean maturity or really being equipped for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So let's begin in Ephesians 4 and verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, as he quotes from the Old Testament here. They try, this is a scene of triumph and the spoils of war as it is. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended to the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, in our previous studies, we looked at the meaning of the church, the beginning of the church, the foundation of the church, the mission of the church, the nourishment of the church, per se. And in this study, we look at the growth of the church, God's way. And in doing so, there are several principles we want to draw out of this passage as it relates to the growth of the church. You see, God wants believers to not merely grow old. He wants them to grow up. And he wants his church to mature. And so principle number one, church growth begins with Jesus Christ and God's grace. It begins with Jesus Christ and God's grace. I want to point out verse 7, but unto each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Notice Christ in verse 7. Notice verse 10. He himself... Christ. Notice verse 12, the body of Christ. Notice again verse 13, the Son of God. Notice verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And so Christ is very predominant in this passage. You must remember the church growth God's way begins in a sense and ends in a way with Jesus Christ and the grace of God. And while he is just emphasized in verses 4 through 6, what? The seven unities that all believers have, he now emphasizes diversity beginning in verse 7. There, in the body of Christ, there's unity and there's diversity. Just like we have hands and feet, ears and a mouth and a nose, but you have one body. So in the body of Christ, there's diversity of gifts. But it's one body, and there's an objective to it all. Keep in mind, what is the basis for your spiritual gifts? Verse 7 again, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The basis of spiritual gifts are grace. It's not asking, not tearing. It's not your performance. It's not your ambition. It's not your zeal. It's God's grace because of what Jesus Christ did. And what did he do? He led captivity captive. He triumphed at the cross. 
and the spoils of war are believers who have come to know Christ and been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And Jesus Christ, through his atoning death and victorious resurrection, took power and control over his enemies. And on the day of Pentecost, via the descent of the Holy Spirit, he gave gifts to men. And so again, we see here, key word, grace. Grace was given. Christ's gift. He himself gave. Very important phrase. Why must we remember this? Because, again, it brings us back to the gospel. It brings us back to Christ. It brings us back to the fact that the building of the church is a divine undertaking. And we must not forget that Christ is the one who builds the church. You don't, and I don't. Principle number two we see from the passage, church growth involves Jesus Christ giving gifted communicators of his word to his church. Gifted communicators of his word to his church. Now keep in mind, the, in the categories, the four categories of gifted men in the passage here deal with apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers, or pastors slash teachers. Those are the four that are particularly mentioned. Now, that's not to suggest there aren't more gifts. We know from Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and even Ephesians 4 here, there's various gifts. In fact, it appears as though there are 20 spiritual gifts specifically mentioned in the Bible for the church. Ten are permanent, ten are temporary. Even in this list of four, we know that apostles and prophets, according to chapter 2, verse 20, were necessary to lay the foundation of the church. Evangelists and pastors, teachers continue on. These were temporary and foundational. These are permanent and necessary to this very day. And so principle number two is church growth involves Jesus Christ giving gifted communicators of his word to his church. Keep in mind, again, the ultimate authority is in the word of God, not in the person. That's why if any pastor ever asks you to do something contrary to scripture, you'd obey God rather than man. But it's these very men that were used to preach the word, to teach the gospel, to communicate divine revelation in those days, in many cases, to write the scriptures. Principle number three. Church growth requires that the gifted communicators of God's truth concentrate on the equipping of the saints via sound doctrine. Via sound doctrine. And this is so very, very important. You see, and he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists. Why? For the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints. And by the way, that's a very, very important phrase in here. What does equipping mean? To equip fully. To making fit. It's not sinless perfection. It's a military term that's used to prepare fully for combat. It implies a process like boot camp, leading to some end like fighting the battle. The Greek word is katartizo. To a doctor, katartizo would be used in the setting of a bone in place. To a fisherman, katartizo meant to mend the nets. To a soldier, katartizo meant to be equipped for battle. To a sailor, katartizo meant outfitting the ship for a voyage. It carries the idea of preparing and repairing. And God desires that the saints get prepared and at times repaired and thus equipped for this 
ministry, the work of ministry God has for them. Now keep in mind that the evangelical church in America for the last many decades has been extremely preoccupied with church growth and getting people into the building of the church. They're big on bodies. They've had contests and prizes and gimmicks. And, and it's incredible. I'm sure if there was a list of all the gimmicks the church has used, it, we would just die laughing in so many ways. And I've heard of some amazing ones. Church in Carol South North Carolina gave away the world's largest hot dog. <laughs> and I don't think it was the pastor. <laughs> you know. Yeah, years ago in the 70s, they were big on bus ministry, 60 and 70. They used to say that Jerry Fowler, who was in Virginia, had a bus crash with Jack Hiles, who was in Indiana. <laughs> you know, bus them in from the fields of sin was the idea, you know. We got to get them into the building. And to get kids on buses, they did all kinds of things. I mean, even in Minneapolis, remember back in the day, when Tony Oliva played for the Twins, they had Tony Oliva sometimes pay him to ride buses so kids would get on the bus to come to Sunday school. So one gimmick after another, after another, after another. You know, there was invite a friend Sunday, bring your dog Sunday, bless your motorcycle Sunday. They do that right here, don't they? Now we have the emergent church. They don't even want to hardly want you to know it's a church, per se. And by the way, it is on the outs. You, those kind of faddish things usually don't last too long. So what do the saints need according to this verse? What do they need? They need equipping, right? Equipping. That's what they need. They don't need entertaining. They need equipping. They need maturing, not marketing. They need edifying, not entertaining. And the gifted men are to be used to equip the saints. And the saints are to do the work of the ministry. And the result is the body of Christ will get built up. You see, it's needed because believers get saved just as they are. They need to be taught how to use the spiritual gifts and blessings that they have been giving. And you know, when people get saved, they get saved with a lot of baggage, sin patterns, other kinds of things. And that's why the primary role of the pastor is to teach them the word of God. Teach them the word of God. That's the only way the saints get equipped. Remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and right, that the man of God may be perfected, matured, equipped for every good work that comes through the word of God. So critically important. Principle number four, church growth necessitates that the equipped saints do the work of ministry. I mean, the objective isn't to sit around and just say, hey, man, we got equipped. Man, this is great. Isn't it great to be equipped saying, yeah, well, I know a lot. Yeah, what are you doing with it? Nothing. Well, no one's getting edified then, I can tell you that. And that's why even in Gibbs here, the objective isn't simply to get people established, but ultimately to get them equipped, to function on a high level, as it were, for Jesus Christ, hopefully. And so again, the equipping of the saints is for what? For the, for the work of ministry. For the work of ministry. Who is to do the work of ministry, by the way? What does the text say? Saints, plural. Oh, no, we're paying the pastor to do that one. You know, we pay the pastor to do all the visitation. We do the, pay the pastor to do that. You know, and, and as you know, here at Duluth Bible Church, this passage, more than any other passage, has impacted how we approach ministry here. This has been it. This has been the blueprint. And we've gone back to this over and over again, been reminded of this over and over again. 
Some people think if you have a church that teaches sound doctrine, they're not going to be practical. That's just not true. Not if you're teaching them correctly. Churches that emphasize the vertical aren't going to have horizontal ministry. That's not true. No. In fact, as they learn to abide in Christ, they become far more fruitful horizontally, too. Otherwise, they just are busy but barren, cranking it out on their own flesh and wondering what's wrong. You can have both. And we are convinced, based on this passage and others, that God wants a total body ministry. The saints are equipped for the work of ministry. I love Wearsby's definition of ministry. Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. By the way, is the ministry work? The work of ministry? Is it work? It is work. And by the way, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And ministry is work. It's labor. It takes time. It takes energy. You get tired times. I would suspect that our whole team will be very tired in El Salvador. In fact, usually in mission trips, I go to bed earlier than I ever do. I, a lot of times, 9 o'clock, I go to bed. I don't ever go to bed at 9 o'clock here. If I go to bed by midnight, I'm doing well. But I go to bed, you know why? Because I am exhausted usually on the mission trips. Because you get up early and you hit it. And you just hit it and you hit it and you hit it. And it's so critical to keep going vertical because you're very involved in horizontal ministry. What are the imbalances to this? What are the imbalances? I wonder if I wrote them down. I didn't write them down, so forget it. Okay, number five. <laughs> church growth is to result in the church being built up qualitatively through edification and normally quantitatively through evangelism. Qualitatively means maturity. Quantitatively means numbers. Now keep in mind, while the goal is not numbers, Okay. On the other hand, don't we want people to get saved? Secondly, in the book of Acts, do they record any numbers? They do. 3,000 saved here, 5,000 saved there. Why do they do that? To show the numerical growth of the church. But numbers is never to be the objective. It is to be the result. And when it becomes the objective... Instead of being faithful to the Lord, preaching the word, seeking to win them to Christ and so forth, once numbers become the objectives, you will resort to gimmicks and such to get bodies and buildings. You know, they came out with an article a couple of years ago about this church in Texas who led the Southern Baptist Convention every year in the amount of people getting baptized. You know why? They kept... Same people kept coming forward every year to get saved again, and because they, not because they thought you could lose it, but they had the Baptist twist that if you're really saved, you won't sin. Da, da, da. So they kept getting saved every year and getting baptized every year. No wonder they led the convention. After all those baptisms, you think their church would be 40,000 people? But it wasn't. Okay? How does ministry to the saved show itself? Number one, officially by personal involvement in the ministries of your local church. Now keep in mind, you don't need to have a position. You don't need to have a position to serve. Okay, we, we realize that. We recognize that. But that is one way. You might minister as son to the Lord, to the saints, by way of teaching or helping in a Sunday school class or the nursery or an usher or the bookstore, or the media ministry or as a deacon or as an elder or in the kitchen or in our music ministry or jail ministry or so forth and so forth. You may. Now, just because you have a position doesn't mean you have a posture of a servant, though, or the passion of one. But I am thankful for those who do the work and labor of love here, serve in so many ways without, with so little complaints. And you know, DBC is not a one-man show. It's not a one-gift church. But also, it may show itself unofficially 
through the fulfillment of all the one another's of the New Testament. And there are a lot of one another's in the New Testament. And you see, as you're walking with the Lord and you pray for one another, you encourage one another, you comfort one another, you minister to one another, you are involved in ministry. And those one another's are relational, so valuable to the body of Christ. But they have to be overflow so they're not pump out. They have to be overflow and not pump out. That's why abide in him, for without him you can do nothing. You can do nothing. How does ministry to the unsaved show itself? Well, through evangelism evangelism. Now, there's other ways that you can be involved in helping people and ministering to them. You can help, you know, give something to the needy or the poor. But, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to Brett yesterday about that very thing. And when he was with the Yanomamu tribe in Venezuela there for 17, 19 years, that he said they really moved, they did not I mean, they were involved in ministering to some of the physical needs. In fact, he said he basically handed out medicine from the morning till 2 in the afternoon. People coming to him day after day, needing medicine for this, that. So they were very involved in helping hand out medicine. But they were not involved in trying to side with every personal social issue. In fact, he told the story of how he got in between two warring tribes and found himself in the middle. And they were going to kill each other. And he sat down. You ever hear this story? Let me tell this story. Yeah, they were going to kill each other, these tribes. They were going to have a war. And he, he found himself in the middle. And he literally had his hand on the chest of this chief and the chest of that chief. Stop him, both of them. And everyone was dancing around, and they were all had their spears and all this. And, and, and it was basically a get-me-back situation. And so he talked them into, instead of killing each other, to do something that they, they uh, culturally did. It's called hit them in the chest. And so what they would do is they would have this guy come forward and he'd stick his chest out and this guy from this tribe would come over and hit him in the chest as hard as he could. He says he would usually go way down and go boom. Now we know that if they hit the right part, they could kill him. Okay, we know that. But frankly, that was a lot better than them using their spears on each other. And so they basically took turns for, I don't know, an hour or two, just wailing on each other, you know, different guys. And they got it out of their system, as it were. And then he said, oh, yeah. And, he, and so then they wanted to pick up rocks and do it. Apparently, they traditionally will at times pick up rocks and then hit you in the chest holding the rock. And he said, no rocks. They all agreed to it finally, you know. And so uh, all these men got all this energy out of them. Nobody got killed, and they all went back. And the next day, he said they were friends. Send them, send them to Ferguson. <laughs> yeah, 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 very good. So, uh, but he went on to say this. He said, basically, we didn't try to clear up most of the um, social kind of things. Like, for example, the Yanomamu didn't wear clothes. Per se. So he, that's not something they tried to even address, per se. What they addressed was the spiritual. And then what happened even, talking about the effect of the word of God on people, after they became believers, and in, on his occasion, he taught through it chronologically once he learned the language and learned the culture, and he taught chronologically. And when he got through the gospel, 60 people got saved basically that day. You know, just like Etau. You ever see Etau? Yeah, similar kind of thing. And then he said they started to establish him in sound doctrine and teach him the word of God. And in doing so, as time went on, he said what happened is he started to work on literacy because they did not have a written language. So then you take this verbal language and you put it into writing. Then you start to teach him how to read. And then you start to develop sentences. And then you start to develop manuals and so forth. And he said the effect it had, not only on the believers, but the unbelievers, as time went on, a lot of social things just took care of themselves. And isn't it true wherever Christianity goes, usually schools and education are emphasized? 
Because God gave us his written word to read. If you can't read it, you're at a hindrance. Usually what overflows from that is hospitals. So what did Brett do? He spent a lot of time handing out medicine every day. But the emphasis was on preaching the gospel, teaching the word. And even with the clothing thing, he tells the funny story. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but this guy came down from the States and he was really bothered that these missionaries just didn't love these people because they did not see their need of clothing, to give them clothing. And so while he was there, he gave them basically everything he had. You know, and he gets on the plane, didn't have any underwear, didn't have any socks. He had a pair of flip-flops on. He hardly had any clothing left. He, gave, he brought a bunch of clothing out and he gave it all out, per se, and so forth. And he's on the plane and tears are coming down. He feels like he made this big difference. And he's, <laughs> Brett said that it was either him or his partner were there among the people who had gathered to say goodbye. And they're all waving goodbye. And he, and, and he looks over at this guy here and he's got a pair of Fruit of the Loom on his head. And he's buck naked, you know, because they didn't value clothes. And this was a little thing, you know, and then something else. And then as he's waving goodbye, one of the guys says in Yanamamu, that guy sure was an idiot, wasn't he? He gave us his clothes. <laughs> so, so again, what we would think would be, here's what you need to do. You know, it wasn't an issue at all. He did say it took him a little while to get used to older women giving him hugs at the end of the church service. But besides that, he said it was, you know, it was an interesting thing. Yes, Philip. About the church, but I've always wondered this. <laughs> Why do those tribes um, not have a, a, the same sense of nakedness like Adam and Eve did? I mean, don't they, don't they feel uncomfortable? I mean, isn't that kind of a natural thing? What happened to that? Well, I, that's a great question. I don't know. Except maybe just over time, culturally, they desensitized to it in their, in their conscience. They did have a little thing... Um, uh, a women would sometimes, they would wear this red little string around their stomach. And, and, and if it broke, they were very embarrassed. But besides that, they didn't wear anything. So <laughs> he said he saw women running out of rooms because the string broke. You know, so. so, yeah, the challenges of missionary work, right? So what we're seeing here is that the uh, saints are to be equipped to do the work of ministry, which results in edification, evangelism, and the circle, in a sense, keeps going round and round and round. That's how it should work. Now, how long a process does church growth involve? Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The word till literally means until. In other words, the process continues on basically throughout the whole church age. Because God ultimately wants a glorified church that's without spot and blemish, holy and blameless in his sight. Till we all come. So church growth, number six, manifests itself with reaching such spiritual goals or objectives as corporate doctrinal unity and the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now remember, remember I pointed out to you that there are three ice clauses in this Sentence two, two, two. Yes. Uh, it should be on, it's on the second handout now. You move to the second handout. Number six. If you jump down to number six. Are you there? No, I'm glad you brought it up for everyone. Number six. Okay. So the first one is he wants corporate doctrinal unity. Notice, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Now, there's a lot of people who want unity today, but they don't want it based on the faith. They want an ecumenical conclave. Now, this is 
unity based upon the faith and involving the knowledge of the Son of God. The knowledge of the Son of God. And so it goes, brings us right back to the scriptures. By the way, how do you get practical unity in a local church? Hold hands more and sway? No. Hug a lot? No, that actually creates disunity if you decide that you like another's hug more than the one you should like. Avoid all doctrinal conversations, especially over anything controversial? No. No, it's, it's unity based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the word of God. And again, the word of God points us to the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we would grow in our understanding of him. Secondly, it manifests itself in complete spiritual maturity. Again, to a perfect man. Perfect man. Doctrinal soundness and personal fellowship with Christ and the believer's walk of faith is to result in spiritual maturity. The Greek word here is teleon, where we get teleos. Doesn't mean sinless perfection, but reaching the goal of personal maturity. Personal maturity. Thirdly, complete Christ likeness. For the perfect man is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. He wants us to become more and more Christ like. And so God wants us to keep growing over time and becoming more and more like the Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God, using the Word of God to point us to the Son of God in a walk of faith and a growth in grace. Fourthly, it manifests itself in spiritual stability and discernment. Now we got to verse 14 for Melinda's sake here. Spiritual stability and discernment. Notice, this is kind of the opposite of verse 13. That we should no longer be children. By the way, the word children is nepios. The word earlier for perfect was teleos. Teleos is mature. Nepios is immature. It's used also in Hebrews 5. They had become nepios. They were not teleos. Those who are teleos are those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That we should no longer be children. There's a place to be nepios, but no longer. In other words, we should get beyond that. What characterizes spiritual immaturity? Being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And you know, as I think of that, isn't it amazing how so many things come down the pike that believers seem to latch onto and lack discernment? You know, promise keepers, prayer of Jabez, Christian exorcisms, one naturism, Christian psychology, lordship salvation, crossless gospel, outer darkness, believers being put into Gehenna, and whatever. I mean, and there's, there's many other ones. But again, it's a reflection of spiritual instability and a lack of discernment. How do you get discernment? You get discernment by getting to know the word of God. You get discernment by getting to know the God of the word in your own personal walk so that you spot these things. Tossed to and fro is a nautical phrase. Just imagine a ship out on the waves getting thrown around. And that's how some believers are. Even people that have come here sometimes. I'm amazed at how they're tossed to and fro and to and fro. Sometimes they come and they leave and they come and they leave and they come and they leave. And they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You know, they're what I call spiritual tumbleweed, as it were. They just get blown around by the next thing that comes down the pike. Number seven, spiritual church growth has as its primary means being speaking the truth in love. 
speaking the truth in love. That's what verse 15 says. But in contrast, be by, of, of being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Now, speaking the truth in love, I, I look at it this way. What comes from the pulpit is the word is to be speaking the truth in love. And as a result, as you take in the word, you are to then be speaking the truth in love. It goes both ways. So you're speaking the truth in love to one another. I'm speaking the truth in love as I teach you, or as your elders teach you, or as teachers teach you. And it's by speaking the truth in love. Now notice, it's not love, 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 and it's not just truth, truth, truth. It's speaking the truth, the objective truth of the word of God, and do it in a way that truly cares about others, in love, in love. And by the way, in light of that, I am careful to guard this pulpit so that what you hear is the truth in love. So we must be truth speakers, and we must do this in love. What does this mean over the pulpit in personal relationships? Just that. Again, here is your teacher. What is he to be doing? Speaking the truth in love to the congregation. What are they to be doing? Speaking the truth in love one to the other. We must speak God's truth in love, including both the positive instructions and the negative warnings. It's both. It's not unloving to warn someone. You continue to go down that direction, you are headed for a heap of trouble. You know, I've had to say some pretty blunt things at times to some people. I was admonishing a believer a while back in which I just said, you know, the Bible says, Proverbs 14, 14, the backslider in heart is filled with his own way. And that's what you are. You're just full of yourself. You're just full of your own ways. But the good man is satisfied from above. And I'm very concerned about you. I admonished him. I warned him. I encouraged him. I appealed to him and so forth, and I don't know that it accomplished anything. But it might. We'll see what the Lord does with it all. Number two, we must be willing to contend for the faith. Otherwise, we'll have no truth to speak in love. You know, speaking the truth in love means that you do contend for the faith. Otherwise, at the end of the day, what do you have to share? So both of those are necessary over the pulpit and in personal relationships within the body of Christ. What about evangelism? Well, when it comes to evangelism, speaking the truth in love means what? Preaching the gospel with compassion but, and with clarity. And with clarity, leaving the results with the Lord. In what areas is this to affect? In all things. That's what the verse is. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things. In all things. And by the way, does the word of God do that? Do you keep teaching verse by verse? Doesn't it cover the gamut? Doesn't it cover everything in life? It's incredible. Number eight, church growth has as its ultimate authority and resource the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimate resource and authority, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 15 again. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. What does headship mean? Headship carries the idea usually of authority and of resource. The head is usually the leader, but also the head is the major resource. You know, try to function without a head. It doesn't last very long. And we need to remember that as well. The ultimate authority, in fact, many times, you know, we pray about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. The elders get together and pray. And one of the things we seek to remember every Sunday is, and Lord, we remember this is your church. The Lord Jesus Christ, you are the head. And we want to worship you in spirit and truth. And we want 
all that would transpire to be glorifying to you and for you to direct with it all. Because he's the head. And that is crucial to remember. See, because if he's the head and he's the resource, then what do we need to do? We need to abide in him. We need to abide in him. Does God expect one individual to do it all? How does verse 16 end? Verse 16, from whom? Now, I want you to notice, from whom? What's the antecedent of whom? Christ. From Jesus Christ, the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, there's that concept of growth again in the passage, for the edifying of itself in love. So God doesn't expect one person to do it all. Everybody is to do their share. As they walk with the Lord, as they get equipped for the work of ministry, and then minister in love to others in the body of Christ. Because again, we have different gifts but all of them are needed, according to 1 Corinthians 12. Let me make some practical applications here, okay? You have a place for that in your handouts? Okay, very good. Number one, since church growth begins with the grace of Christ and ends with the power of Christ, we need to resist legalistic armbar tactics or worldly gimmicks to motivate and accomplish divine objectives. That's why, you know, here at Duluth Bible, I don't pressure anybody to do anything. If they don't want to do it, if they don't want to do it as on to the Lord, or if they're tired of doing it, don't do it. We'll trust the Lord to provide. We'll trust the Lord someone else will take the place. And if it doesn't, then we need to probably shut that ministry down and keep moving on. And you know, it really relaxes the whole thing. No pressure here at all. Either you do what you do as on to the Lord or, or don't do it. And I want people to feel free to quit a ministry if they feel like they need to. You know, in some churches, you, you sign up for Sunday school, you're in for a life. You know. And also worldly gimmicks. Let's stay away from worldly gimmicks. We, we don't operate based on quasi-sanctified vaudeville, you know, like some churches do. Number two, the gifted men are to equip the saints through teaching the word of God they need to be diligent students of God's word. To do so, the congregation must recognize the pastor's commitment to expository preaching and guard this priority. To have the freedom of time to devote to this, equipped in submissive saints, need to come to the plate and relieve the pastor of unnecessary duties. Paying him a sufficient salary, if possible, is also necessary. Now, that's a very practical thing there. I mean, again, in some churches, they expect the pastor to do basically everything. You know, I'm really glad that over the years, it's not that I shouldn't be willing to do things, but I understand God hasn't called me to do certain things and that there's other believers who can do it. So why not let them do it? Why derive the, or take from them the opportunity to serve in certain ways? And they need to grow. You know, Pastor Rack used to say, you want to find the inner circle in the church? The inner circle are the people who clean the toilets. He says, that's the inner circle right there. You know, that's where you want to start. If you're not willing to clean the toilets, then you're not thinking right. The inner circle. And it's also true, paying them a sufficient salary. You know, some churches are like, we want to keep our pastor humble. We're going to pay him not much. Oh, really? So let me ask you a question. Do you take that approach to your job? You don't want to be inflated in pride in your job. Why don't you go to your boss next week and say you want to lower your salary? You know, how goofy can you get? And you know, at the end of the day, we say, oh, more to be desired are they than gold. The word of God is priceless. Well, isn't the person who's communicating the word of God worthy of double honor? The Bible says he is. Number three, if equipped saints are to be or to do the work of ministry, they must be willing to get equipped. 
hearing face-to-face -face teaching on a regular basis from their pastor teacher is crucial in the growth process. Unless they are being fed and growing themselves, they will run out of spiritual gas in serving the Lord. This is counterproductive. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And that's one of the reasons why if someone's serving in Sunday school <laughs> or in some other ministry, we really want them to be hearing the word of God at least once a week face to face. Because otherwise they start wavering spiritually, going down the tubes, but they might still keep coming here. And in fact, I've seen in some cases the nursery, Sunday school, even the medium room becomes a haven for them not to hear the word. Because they're saying no in their heart. It's their way out from hearing it. And if you don't think that happens here, I, I can think of three cases where I know it happened. And probably more than that. Number four, equipping the saints is not primarily accomplished by some special program in the church like Gibbs. It begins with the gathering of the saints to worship the Lord and to learn his word during our regular service. It overflows in personal fellowship with other believers around the kitchen table. I do 95% of my counseling over our pulpit by seeking to faithfully teach the whole counsel of God. You know, and it does bother me. I will minister to someone who doesn't come out here regularly, who wants to meet with me. I will, I will meet with them, but I won't meet with them many times. Otherwise, what they do is they want sidebar service. We're not going to eat when the family eats. Can you serve me on the side? You know, why don't you just come and eat when the family eats? It would be like you being a mother and, you know, family sits down at 5 o'clock, and one kid doesn't want to get off the couch, and then at 7, he comes over and says, can you feed me, Mom? What would you do? Say, yeah, get, a, get your duff off the couch and get here at 5. Otherwise, go without it. You know, you might give him a break the first time, but you're not going to keep doing that. Number five, the objective in equipping the saints is not to get people busy, but to let God use them to minister. As needs arise and the Lord opens the doors, this may be in official or unofficial ways. It's amazing what ministries may happen when you do that. And I'll tell you, when people are taking the word and they're using it, they're teaching it, they're sharing it, they get excited about it as well. Number six, before we start a new ministry, the church leaders need to ask themselves, are there enough horses to do the job? If not, we should not start it or this will lead to frustration, burnout, or people stretching themselves too thin. Number seven, when considering some of the particular ministry, someone for particular, we look for the fat people. There's quite a few of those around, by the way. Faithful, available, and teachable who are growing and gifted in that area. We do not give them a position hoping that they will be faithful and finally start serving. If they have not learned to do whatever they do faithfully is on to the Lord, we are playing spiritual Russian roulette. Also, unless they are submissive to church leaders, instead of being self-willed, we are going to potentially create a lot of problems. Now, these are all really practical things. And I can use illustrations of all of these if I wanted to over the years. Number eight, let's never downplay the importance of the local church. We have sought to train our future leadership from within. This best secures the doctrine and direction of our church, assuming these are good and godly over the long haul. You know, years ago, I had a woman come to me in Minneapolis when we had the Bible study down there and it wasn't a church yet. And she said to me, Pastor Dennis, I have a question for you. What are you doing to secure the doctrine and direction of Duluth Bible Church in the future should you die? She said, one of the problems, obviously, when Heritage Trail, when Pastor Radke died, is there weren't people that were really equipped to kind of take over and maintain that. So what are you doing differently? That's a good question. Good question. Number nine, remember that the key to the horizontal ministry is the vertical, your fellowship with the Lord. Otherwise, we'll have a church full of Marthas banging the pots and pans instead of Mary's, sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus and serving with loving devotion under his power and direction. 
Number 10, since the edification of the church and the glory of Jesus Christ are the bottom line objectives, measure any potential ministry or change by asking, will God be glorified and will the church be edified by this? If not, we simply need to can it. Simply need to can it. Because there are a lot of things you can do, but a lot of them aren't worth it. Or they're secondary, or they're not what God has called us to do. Well, that was practical. You know, Brent Nasworth approached me while he was here saying, Dennis, would you be willing to work with DM2 to take the Church God's Masterpiece series and have us turn it into a, can we use it as a course? He said, because there's really nothing like it out there that we know of. And it is. It's, it's principled and it's practical and it hopefully will help shape your thinking. You know, Kurt had it downloaded in Africa and the MP3s and the students in Zambia listened to it. And when he came back, he says they were a buzz because their church structures, the way they approach things, the stuff we're covering here, it's nothing like they had ever heard before, ever. And yet, it's a lot of it's just rooted in Scripture, with practical application in light of principles. And frankly, look to the Lord, follow the blueprint, let Him build the church, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, don't compete, and watch what the Lord does. Now, this is all valuable and important to you. Because I don't know what the Lord's plan is for you, but if the Lord has you to be a pastor or a pastor's wife or involved in some kind of significant ministry down the road, not that all aren't important, but what I mean is a high level of teaching, you need to remember these very things right here. Because you're going to be working in a team concept. You're going to be sent out from a church or working with a church or through a church. And these are things you need to remember. And not only remember for yourself, but be able to share with others so that they can understand the plan of God. Because frankly, my observation is most churches don't function biblically at all. They're usually dominated by women a lot of times, or they have wimpy leaders, or they're not teaching sound doctrine. Or the saints are getting equipped. The big issue every year at Vacation Bible School is what craft are we going to do? They're not even thinking about lessons and the da 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 da. They don't even think that way. They don't even know how to think that way. And as I've said before, the weakness of the Church of Jesus Christ, I'm convinced, is not due to poor program, it's due to poor teaching. And even about the teaching of the church. So very important. Well, our time is gone, so let's pray.